Hey everybody, this is Andrew Latepolo, and I'm here with Nick Weinberg, one of our ultrasound fellows at Mass General, and we're going to talk about this awesome case that Nick had just a little while back. Yeah, so this was uh, on our acute side of our emergency department. Uh, it was a pretty routine day, and uh, a 67-year-old female uh, rolled in by EMS, and uh, she was previously uh, healthy with no significant medical problems. Um, she presented with three weeks of gradually worsening fatigue and shortness of breath. Um, on arrival, she was quite ill-appearing. Her, her extremities were cool and clammy. Uh, her vitals, she was tachycardic, heart rate in the 120s. Her blood pressure was on the low side of normal, about 110 over 80. She was tachypnic in the 30s. Her SATs were on the low side of normal, the low 90s. Uh, she was afebrile. So very broad differential diagnosis. Anything else in exam? Yeah, one interesting thing about this patient is she had very prominent uh, JVD, that's jugular venous distension, so very prominent bulging neck veins So we, we always argue about JVD because Nick is the world's number one fan of JVD, and of course... That is a fact. Yeah. <laughs> that is a fact, <laughs> and I that just requires examining a patient, so I never see it. So anyway, but your differential was narrowed. Yeah, it was narrowed when we looked up at the monitor. Yeah, so how would you interpret that? Yeah, I mean, this this looks like a classical case of something, you know, we hear about in medical school and see on our board exams, and it looks like electrical alternance to me. Great, so what's your next step? So I, I ran, bas I basically was quite sure she, she had... Uh, a pericardial effusion, and I ran and grabbed the ultrasound. I'm quickly. surprised you didn't have it with you in the room. <laughs> yeah, already. Well, that was that was you know, I'm learning. You know, <laughs> <laughs> great. So, what do you see here? So, uh, this is pretty impressive uh, parasternal long view um, with bedside cardiac ultrasound um, with a very large pericardial effusion, which you can see right there. Um, and you can see that the heart is swinging uh, on its axis, which is basically why we saw the electrical alternance right, exactly. uh, on the monitor. One other prominent thing that we see here is diastolic collapse of the right ventricle, which is very concerning for, for acute tamponade physiology. Right, and that's the first question. When you see pericardial effusion, you should always think, are there signs of tamponade? When you see that right ventricular collapse, then you get quite concerned. So these are our other standard uh, cardiac views. So top left is the parasternal long view, which we just looked at. Top right is the parasternal short view, and you can really see how the heart is swinging uh, in that view. Uh, bottom left is our subxiphoid view, and bottom right is our apical four-chamber view. Yeah, nice, great pictures. The next thing we did was measure uh, pulsus paradoxus, or the equivalent by ultrasound. And we take our, our pulse wave Doppler and place the gate um, just downstream of the mitral valve, and we are measuring uh, mitral inflow velocity. And the uh, respiratory variation that you see there. Yeah. So of note for everybody watching, you do not need this to diagnose tamponade. This is just an additional fun finding. We, don't, we didn't even get the best pictures here, um, but you do see some variation in the peak velocity. Um, and when it's greater than 25% decrease, that is considered an echocardiographic sign of tamponade. Anywhere else we can look? Yeah, so we were also, uh, also just wanted to see other findings, um, ultras, uh, that we see an ultrasound uh, in the uh, you know in the presence of tamponade. So we looked at the IVC to see if she had a bulging IVC, and uh, sure enough, she did have a very uh, full or plethoric uh, IVC. Um, and you can see right there is the IVC. Uh, we know this is the IVC and not the aorta because you see that it is contiguous uh, with the heart right, on good. the left. So two comments on that. One, if you saw a dilated, uh, sorry, a collapsing and skinny. IVC, you might wonder, is the cause of um, hypotension in this patient actually tamponade? Second thing is we generally think of looking at the IVC as a way to guide fluid management. And tamponade is one of these exceptions that when you see a dilated IVC without collapsibility, 
you still want to give IV fluids to maximize your preload. The whole game with tamponade is it's a fight between pressures on the outside of the right ventricle and pressures on the inside of the right ventricle. And by giving IV fluids and maximizing your preload, you are giving the right ventricle a chance to fight the pressures on the outside um, so the patient does not become hypotensive. So is that what you did? That sure enough is well, what we did. Perfect. Good. Yeah. And so what happened? So we gave her about two liters of normal saline. And she initially improved. Her blood pressure um, remained stable. Um, and she kind of held her own. However, over time, she started to worsen clinically. Uh, she became slightly altered. Her skin became mottled. Uh, she grew increasingly more somnolent. And her blood pressure started to drop in the 70s over 40s range. Right. We became so pretty it, concerned about her. It's tempting morning. to still continue to give IV fluids, which you usually can do in a patient, even when their IVC is uh, dilated. But she also became a little hypoxic. And so this is where you start worrying. You, when you, the next look would be here. Yeah, so we, we, she became more tachypnic and a little bit hypoxic. First thing we did is grab the ultrasound probe again and put, put the probe on her lungs. And sure enough, she did have uh, sonographic B lines, which you can see here. It's these little vertical lines coming down here. Now, this is not an overwhelming picture, but the fact that she didn't have them initially and was starting to develop them and was now hypoxic and was hypotensive to us signify that we should probably do something other than just keep giving her fluids. So... So we felt at this point our only option left was to conduct a pericardiocentesis. Great. You want to talk us through how yeah, you do that? Sure. So, um, of course, we have our bedside ultra, ultrasound machine already available, and uh, that has really become the standard of care for, for pericardiocentesis, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in future slides. Um, we grabbed a, a triple lumen central venous catheter just because they're readily available in the emergency department. But presumably, you could use a large bore IV or another a type of single lumen uh, central line as well. Um, we also use sterile technique. Um, you know, she wasn't, uh, you know, about to code, but she was worsening. Uh, so we did have time to use sterile technique, which is optimal. If you so can. I remember learning this in residency: is the way to do pericardiocentesis is you do a sub foot approach and you go through the liver or through the diaphragm. Is that the way to do it? Yeah, so that's also how I learned in residency, and I did a few of those back, back in the old days. Um, and you can see that traditional approach here in the left box. And basically, you go in the sub region, and you aim for the, the tip of the left scapula. And you typically go through the liver and the diaphragm. Um, it's a pretty, you know, it's a, it's a pretty crude procedure. There's risk of injuring other organs. Um, and the ones I've done in the past were not, uh, I, you know, I was not always confident I was in the right place, um, and they are not ideal in my opinion. I think traditionally that was the way to do it because before we had ultrasound, that seemed to be the safest approach. You're going to an inferior portion where you're less likely to actually have a cardiac injury. But with ultrasound, we can actually see exactly where the heart is, exactly where we should go. And so there are two different ways to do that. Right. So uh, one way is the ultrasound guided parasternal approach, which you can see in the middle box here, where you basically go in the parasternal view and um, you guide the needle in with the probe. Uh, one, one problem here is that you can potentially lacerate the coronary arteries. Um, and then the other uh, possible option is to take the apical approach, where you aim from the apex, kind of where you place the probe for your apical four chamber view and then angle towards the heart that way. And you can put the probe either right where the needle is for the apical approach, the way we do most ultrasound guided procedures, or you can do what I like to call the telescopic approach, which is put the ultrasound probe at a remote place from where your needle is. The right answer for which, which uh, method to choose is to go for where the fluid is the most. So how would you decide, what would you say based on this view? Yeah, so again, this is our uh, parasternal long view. So uh, this would be kind of the parasternal area here where the cursor is, and then over here is our apex. And you can see that the, the heart is swinging pretty, pretty wildly here and coming very close to the anterior chest wall here. So that uh, parasternal approach that we just looked at in the middle box would really not be ideal because there's a very good chance you could hit the, left, uh, hit, hit the ventricle of the heart and possibly damage the right. arteries. Whereas on the other side, you see many centimeters of free space, just fluid over here. Yeah. Um, and so we did that with this approach, holding the probe here and watching the needle and the wire come through here. Unfortunately, we do not have a grip clip of that. But once it went in, we were able to drain some fluid and what happened? Yeah, so this is post-pericardiocentesis, 
And uh, you can see here that there's a significantly reduced amount of pericardial fluid. The heart is no longer kind of swinging on its axis as it was before. Um, and then you can see here faintly that there is a catheter uh, coming in. That's the triple lumen catheter that's coming in from the chest wall at the apex. Here's a view of a parasternal wall. You can see the heart is, is much happier, much less fluid. Um, and the heart rate is nicely slowed down. And you do not see that right ventricular scalloping that we saw beforehand. So what happened? You saved the yeah. day? Well, we were pretty pretty happy that this was a successful procedure and we saw a resolution of tamp tamponade physiology. And she did improve following this. And, you know, we kind of thought we were done and that we kind of saved the day and could move on. But However, what happened? over the next hour or so, she actually began to worsen. She again became hypotensive and tachypnic and became modeled again and started to look pretty crummy. That's got to feel very unrewarding. Yeah. I think you just saved this lady's exactly. life. Exactly. an amazing thing. And yeah. now, did you mess it up? Did yeah. you... So what's yeah. your next step? For, there was a period where I thought this was all in vain and I was a little bit disappointed. But of course, I... I went and grabbed the ultrasound again to try to figure out what was going on. You know, did she re move. did she reaccumulate fluid in her pericardial sac, or was there some other um, acute process going on? Right. And what did you see? Yeah. So this is a, our apical four chamber view, uh, similar to some of the previous images we just saw. And so we're not. I we are not really seeing that right ventricular scalping there. So I think yeah. it's probably not a problem of reaccumulation. Exactly. Yeah. I, I didn't think that this was, uh, you know, a recurrence of her tamponade physiology. However, we did notice something else with these with these images. What's that? Well, the first thing I noticed was that her right ventricle now looked very large compared to the right, left ventricle, mm -hmm. which you can see there. Yep. I also noticed a few other findings on this. Um, Namely, that the septum seemed to be bowing into the left ventricle. Yeah. Okay. There was decreased RV contractility, which you can see here. It's not really doing a whole lot. Yeah. Uh, and I started to get concerned about a pulmonary embolism at this point. And so I looked for further signs of pulmonary embolism on echocardiography, and I saw a few more findings. Um, she probably has something called McConnell's sign here, which is basically decreased RV contractility with apical sparing, and you can see that the apex is moving, yeah. uh, whereas the rest of the, the right. RV really isn't moving all that much. I'll give much. you that. So maybe, yeah, it's, maybe a mild McConnell sign. It's subtle, but I think it might be there. Right. And then the last thing is is something called uh, decreased TAPSI. TAPSI stands for a tricuspid annular plane systolic exc excursion. And it's basically vertical motion of the, the plane in which the tricuspid valve sits. And usually the right ventricle contracts vertically in this plane, and you can see it's not really moving up and down right. very much. Right, this usually moves up and down a lot, and here you're not seeing that move. So how is that possible? How can you postulate then that did your pericardiocentesis cause a pulmonary embolism? Did you injure the heart and she had an RV infarction? How is it possible that beforehand, not the perfect views because the heart swings so much, but I don't see much RV dilatation here or any sort of septal bone here, whereas afterwards, it's pretty obvious. Yeah. It, the RV looks much bigger here than it did here, and you're having some D signs. So now what? Yeah. How is that possible? So this is, these are pretty impressive images, I have to say, um, because the heart looks basically like a different heart before and after the pericardiocentesis. Um, and what, what I conjectured was that uh, she may have had an underlying pulmonary embolism, um, and that physiology that we see with pulmonary embolism was masked by the uh, confining pressure of the tamponade physiology. And that was then unmasked once we removed that confining pressure uh, with the pericardiocentesis. And that, to me, is the most amazing thing of this entire case. As we mentioned earlier, there's an entire fight in the right ventricle of the pressures on the outside and the pressures on the inside. And so we try to maximize the preload by giving her fluids beforehand. And then we reduce the pressures in the outside, but while doing that, we unmasked that she actually had had higher right ventricular pressures. And you can see here, septal flattening is a marker of those higher right ventricular pressures. So then what'd you do? So at this point, uh, we ordered a CT scan, which unfortunately showed bilateral pulmonary emboli. Confirming our, our suspicion. So this lady with no medical history had not only cardiac tamponade, and but she also had bilateral pulmonary emboli. Right. 
Wow, fantastic. So I'm assuming you treated her. Yeah, so she got admitted to the ICU, obviously. Unfortunately, ended up having uh, metastatic lung cancer, which presumably caused both of these um, these problems. Right. Uh, but she did get anticoagulated and improved and was eventually discharged from the hospital. That's awesome. Yeah. So this, for all you sonophiles out there, this is a great sono-friendly case where not only was ultrasound used to diagnose the cardiac tamponade, we then identified the fluid overload by looking at the lungs when we gave too much fluid. And we were then able to guide the pericarditis and then afterwards diagnose the right heart strain, which led us to get the CAT scan to get the pulmonary embolism. Great case, Nick. Uh, it's really, really amazing stuff and a great ultrasound learning case. Yeah, it was awesome. All right. Check out our website and uh, follow us on Twitter and uh, keep scanning. <laughs>